Okay, so it is now recording. We are starting and we have gotten all our conversations about crickets out of our system and we're good to go. So let me share our screen. All right, and that would be my friendly reminder to myself, but I've already taken care of that. So it's gonna be a good day and a good session because we're already ahead of schedule. Oh, do that. I had two monitors, unplug that. It's a fascinating beginning of the recording, by the way, for people watching. All right. Hi, everybody. So we are, let's see, let me get my participants up here real quick. And my chat box up. There we go. And we are going. So good morning, everyone. Uh, we are talking about regular and substantive interaction. So uh, this really, really, really is designed to be an interactive session. Um, in all honesty, I mean, maybe this is great news for you. We might be done in 20 minutes if no one asks any questions or has any examples to share, anything like that. Uh, you know, we're going to um, kind of define it, talk about why it's important, you know, talk about $731 million fines, for example, um, and then talk about what are some ways that you can do it and incorporate that into your class. But what I want to do is real quickly, let's have a hopefully everyone or almost everybody just real quickly like in a sentence or two what is substantive regular and substantive interaction how would you define it what's an example of it anything like that i just want to know what people know about it so far so go All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna unmute all of you and start calling on you. <laughs> so what? Give me a sentence or two, and feel free to say I've never heard of it before. Tim, I see lots of responses in chat. Tim, oh. uh, Tim, I have um, Mondays and Fridays emails to the whole class, mm -hmm. reminding them of uh, their weekly assignments. And then uh, as the week goes on, I email each one of them personally on their progress. Fabulous. That would absolutely count. Okay, we've got uh, daily and back and forth communication from Matt. That's right. Uh, Rebecca says, interacting with your students on a regular basis with a variety of methods. And yeah, she's using two keywords there, regular and variety. Good. Uh, Lisa says, interacting with students in a meaningful way. Also, fantastic. Anyone else? I see Barry and Nasser have live mics. Barry, what would you say? I said, how do you know I'm a doofus? <laughs> that would be me that's the doofus, not you. Yeah, I got it. Okay. All right. Nasser, how about you? Again, feel free to say I'm a little unclear, but how would you define regular and substantive interaction? I usually uh, get in contact with students one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, at school or via any communication uh, mean. I mean, it's either, whether email or a text message like after the COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, to stay uh, uh, current and consistent with, with students. So to let them their progress, where they are at and what they are missing. Fabulous. Okay, so I noticed we all tend to go in the same direction. Almost everybody talked about I'm talking to my students, I'm interacting with my students, you know, things like that. Um, let me ask, Oh, my video turned off. Sorry about that. Let me ask, uh, Brian, do you mind if I pick on you and feel free to say go away, Tim, or I'm in the middle of sending an email to my dean or something like that. But Brian, can regular and substantive interaction, can you design it in advance? Can it be part of the course? Or does it have to be something where you reach out to a student and talk to them? What, what would your thoughts be on that? 
Well, I'm actually uh, designing it in advance where I'm breaking up the groups into pods so that we can have more direct communication. Uh, each pod will meet for two hours at least once a week. The assignments then will be turned in, which then I will do meaningful evaluations on the assignment through Canvas. And also I send out announcements uh, through Canvas. And if I need to directly communicate with a student, um, I will send them an email setting up an office hour or uh, finding a time that we can talk. Plus I have regular office hours uh, every single day in the afternoon where they can email me and I can set up a time with them. Okay, so that was a perfect answer. I'm gonna close the session. It was recorded, let's all go home. <laughs> no, I mean, that's a great example. Let's focus on the first part of it. He's designing it in advance because everything he said, again, there's so many different ways to get regular and substantive interaction, but everything that he said, especially at the beginning was very true. He's designing it in advance by putting them into pods. That's an intentional choice that he made. He said, if I put people in a group of 20, nobody's going to talk. Everybody's going to look at the other 19 people. And sorry if I'm putting words in your mouth, Brian, but I'm assuming this is your thought process. Let's put people in groups of four or five where they have to talk to each other and they have to interact. And that is absolutely part of regular and substantive interaction. So great, great answer. And everything he said was part of it. You know, the announcements, the emails, the communication, you guys have done a great job. So what's nice, I don't know where it is on these slides, but somewhere uh, on the slides, it's going to say, um, most of you are already doing it. At least, you know, you're, you feel like you're 75 or 80% of the way there. And I think what you, what Brian just said, and all of your guys answers to what you're saying is you already know a lot of this. Let's give you some formal definitions. Let's give you some checklist stuff like that. But for those of you who go, man, I email my students twice a week. Uh, if anyone misses class, I reach out to them individually. I have office hours. I take my most common question that I get and actually write it up and post it as an announcement. Every single one of these things are examples of regular and substantive interaction. So again, it makes me happy because I hear you guys saying this. It says my work here is going to be way easier because you guys are anywhere from 50 to 110 percent of the way there. Okay, Barry, yes. Uh, one other thing that I do, uh, especially when I get a new group, I do it with everybody every quarter. I sit down with them one-on-one -on -one and I say, what do you want to do in your career? Okay, where, where is this training taking you? Let's, let's think about this. You, you know, yeah, you can get a grade, you can get a degree, but after that, you need to do the work. Mm -hmm. So let's get as much of this out of this as we can. And uh, I stopped doing that a, a couple of quarters and I noticed people started showing up a day or two a week. Yeah. So I'm, I'm picking that up again heavy. And I'm going to say, this is about your future, your life, man. I mean, take advantage of this. And uh, I want to get them excited about it. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's a good idea. And, and not only is it a good idea, Barry, and first of all, it's good. It's good instruction. But that is absolutely something the Department of Education very clearly says is part of regular and substantive interaction is talking to them about the course, talking to them about the program, talking to them about career goals, talking to them about the project. So all of that kind of large scale up here conversation absolutely can. And again, you should do it anyways. You're exactly right because it makes the students more engaged. You have better success, all of that sort of stuff. But yes, it also absolutely meets that standard of regular and substantive interaction by saying, hey, I want you to map out what your next 18 months are going to look like. Or in your case, I want you to map out where you want to be 10 years from now and how you and I can partner to do that. All of that stuff. Again, great teaching in and of itself, but as part of regular and substantive interaction. Okay, so let's kind of go with the presentation. Uh, the most important thing we're going to learn today is it's pronounced substantive. So there you go. Again, we can, we can stop the presentation, but I have a lot of people, uh, is it substantive? Is it substantive? Uh, I have someone who I work with who I'm not going to pick on, but I've now gotten inside his head and it's literally incapable of him to pronounce the word right. He'll like go off into a corner, pronounce it right, and then come up and go, all right, it's pronounced sub substantive. Ah, and then run away. So substantive, we're all on the same page now, okay? But to make life much, much easier, uh, rather than saying 570 times regular and substantive interaction, please feel free to use the initial RSI as we're talking about it. So I may say, you can add RSI to your class by doing that. So that 
takes a giant mouthful of syllables out of your words and, and makes it much easier, okay? So what is it? There's a long history of it. It goes back a couple of decades. I'm not gonna incorporate it. If any of you have to do a you know, presentation on it or something like that, or you're a history buff, I've got about a four page write up I sent to, I believe Al a couple of years ago when this was kind of surfacing in the colleges, I'll be happy to send it to you. But the basic point is the Department of Education uh, established some guidelines and said, um, hey, if you are um, a distance education, if you're offering that, then it needs to be distance education. The key thing was around financial aid. So in order to be eligible for financial aid, your courses need to be distance education. And the Department of Education started saying, you know what, that course or those courses you're offering, they're not distance education, they're correspondence courses. And the Department of Education then said, you know what, at least 51% of the courses you offer have to be distance education. If not, you're not gonna be eligible for financial aid. The headline a lot of people saw a couple of years ago was they said that to WGU and said, you owe us $731 million of financial aid you have to pay back to us and you are no longer eligible to receive financial aid. Uh, skipping forward a couple of years, WGU appealed it and ended up being overturned, but at least made headlines both in the regular news and definitely in education stuff saying, oh my goodness, is this the end of distance education? So uh, it has to be distance education and the very basic without getting into the technical stuff, which you will in a bit, is that that means that there's that interaction. Uh, any of you have taken a distance learning course, if you've taken a lot of them, you've had that horrible course where you had where you genuinely wondered if the instructor died halfway through the course. You know, it was a radio silence. It took you two weeks to get a response back. There were no announcements posted. It basically seemed like the instructor enrolled you in the class on day one or two, said good luck, and then went on a fishing vacation and planned on coming back with one day left in the quarter, grading all your paperwork and conducting a survey. Okay, that is a correspondence course. And for those of us who are old enough, we actually remember what a correspondence course was. The one where you took the course, you wrote the essay by hand or on your typewriter, you know, or maybe in a beginning word processor, you know, videos were sent to you and you put your VHS tape into the TV and watched it, wrote your essay and sent it back. So if you think of that, that's what the Department of Education is thinking of with the correspondence course, okay? And then, um, Obviously, that's not what they're looking for with financial aid. They want exactly what you guys have talked about. We want to have that interaction with the student so the student knows how they're doing. You know, there's nothing worse than you're stuck on something, you ask for help, and you don't know how to navigate the course, okay? Matt, I'm 99% certain you're serious. So you took an ice cream making correspondence course? That sounds awesome. <laughs> Okay, so we kind of talked about all this. I do want to draw your attention to that very last uh, bullet point. You know, anytime you see the all caps, then that means it's probably kind of important. So really, the one thing we really want to stress to you guys today, again, so many of you guys are doing a great job of this. What we want to stress to you guys is documentation, okay? So here's the picture I want to paint in your head. The Department of Education is coming for us. It's not a question of if. It's a question of when. They've already audited uh, Highline, uh, Spokane, and I think a couple of others. So they've audited, I think, four uh, CTCs in this state. Um, and so they're gonna come in and they're gonna say, hey, we're auditing you. We wanna make sure that all of your distance education courses actually have this regular and substantive interaction. And the point being, if we're paying students to come to your college and we're paying for the classes, we wanna make sure that they're getting a good education. And this is one of the ways that we define that. So uh, you guys, I'm sure if you're not familiar with the Department of Education, you've got a really good idea. Are they gonna accept it when I go, yep, I promise we do it. Scouts honor, we do a good job of it. You guys can all go back to Washington and leave us alone now. Any chance that that works? Zero, right? So what they're gonna say is, uh, you know, they've done some audits and we all share our information within the college. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna say, all right, we want to check uh, your nursing program. We've chosen that randomly. So we're gonna audit that and we're gonna look at these classes here, these five classes, you know, PNUR 101 and 107, and sorry if I don't know the numbers, 110 and 213. 
And we want you to actually document exactly how you provide regular and substantive interaction. They also may do it by a student. They picked out at Highline, they picked out, I think, 10 uh, online students randomly and then said, we want to see every course that they've taken. We want to audit those courses and see how that student got regular and substantive inter interaction. So again, Scouts Honor, not going to work very well at that point in time. So if you guys are doing this great job, you know, for example, if you're sending out emails, please send the emails in Canvas, if at all possible, because then we have that audit trail. So if they audit Ingrid's class, we can just go into the email and say, look, here's all the emails that she sent to students and document it that way. You know, if you post announcements, that cap that's captured in Canvas. So we can go into Emily's, uh, sorry, Emily, I forgot, 172, 174. Anyways, whatever the, the math class is, I think it's 174 that she teaches. 172. 172, I was close. So we can go into Emily's 172 class and go, look, here's all the weekly announcements she does. And in addition to these really good weekly announcements she sends out laying out what she's doing for the week, notice also this Wednesday and this Thursday, she said, hey, a lot of you are having problems with this assignment. Let me explain to you the problem some of you are having and how to not run into that problem. Or let me show you, you know, how to factor a polynomial because it seems like a lot of you had issues with this. You know, maybe she records a quick video walking them through things, you know. Maybe Barry does a, hey, I've noticed a lot of you guys are running into a problem with this. I'm going to do a shoot a quick three-minute video showing you guys how to do it. So they're looking for stuff like that. As long as that stuff is hosted inside the Canvas course, then we're all good. If it goes outside of there, the problem is Barry, three years from now, has to go back and say, okay, how did I provide that? Where did I put that video that I shot three years ago? We'd like to avoid that at all costs. And you can integrate it at the end of the quarter for the following quarter into Canvas. Yep, yep. And I know, I know a lot of people do that. They shoot it, they either put it in at the time or at the end of the quarter, they say, I need to make sure I capture that. And then they put it going forward and it's right there. Okay, so that's what we're talking about when we say documentation. So here are, here's how the Department of Education defines a regular and substantive interaction, okay? Distance education should be delivered through an appropriate form of online media. Don't worry about that. You guys are using Canvas. That's talking about, they actually had to define what appropriate media was. So we can skip that one. Distance education must use instructors that meet accreditor requirements for instruction. Again, we're going to skip that. That's the WGU issue right there, is if you have an advisor, do they actually count as faculty or not? So that's what that bullet point is about, okay? So we're going to look at these last three, because this is the part that you care about. There should be at least two forms of substantive interaction, okay? And yes, we're going to define those, and yes, we're going to give you examples. Don't worry, but it says you have to provide substantive interaction, and it, has, and it can't just be announcements. It can't just be lecture. It has to be at least two. There must be, and yes, there's the quote marks on there, the scare quotes, there must be scheduled and predictable opportunities for instructor-student interaction. Again, we're going to define it and give you examples in a bit. And instructors must be responsive to students' requests for support. And again, that's getting back to that thing we talked about, about the instructor who went fishing for nine weeks. If you're flailing in the course, the instructor has to say, okay, I know you're dying on this essay. Let me clarify what I'm looking for on point three, okay? So any questions on that? Matt, I have a, uh, oh, Matt, no team, I have a question for the, uh, the Outlook when you replied mm -hmm. from a Canvas message. I mm -hmm. usually replied from Outlook. Is it documented on Canvas? Ingrid, you're saying no. Have you verified that? I thought she was saying no, that she didn't have a question. Oh. Oh, sorry. I oh, thought okay. you were answering um, no to Emily. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Okay, no problem. Uh, yes, as long as you reply directly, you get that really long string where it says it's coming from inside the course, then that is captured inside it because it's kind of being routed through there. So as long as you stay with that and you're not directly emailing the student, all of that stuff stays inside Canvas. All of that is audited. All of that is archived and captured. Good question, Emily. All right. Any other questions? Just one, Tim. Yes. If we contact a student who is in need of one-on-one -on -one support, mm -hmm. contact them through Canvas and have a 
phone conversation after that interaction, is that considered documented that we met with them? You know, I would put that somewhere. I would make myself a little log or something like that. Uh, maybe even put a note inside the grade book, you know, anywhere where you're gonna be able to find it easily, whatever. I'm not gonna tell you what your structure is, but just somewhere it's easily documented. You don't have to go into all the details, share any confidential information, but just say, you know, talk to Johnny's student for 60 minutes about questions. Could I send them a direct Zoom link and would that be considered documentation? Yeah, so long as again, if someone came and asked, then yes. So you're able to say, oh yeah, that Zoom link there, that's where I met with Johnny for an hour and talked to him about his project. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, we, we're really not trying to make this hard and believe it or not, the Department of Education is not even trying to make it hard. Again, they just want to, when they come to Brian and say, did you do this? Brian can say, yes, I did. And here's the proof so you don't have to take my Boy Scout oath, you know, as a word. Tim, I'm just guessing those don't have to be actual recorded videos as long as we have a record of the meeting Absolutely. happening. Yeah, great question. No, there's all sorts of issues there. For example, what if the student shared something about how they were abused or something like that? So no, you want to, you absolutely can have the student, you know, feel free that it's not being recorded. They can share stuff. Also, that's a ton of recordings you have to save just for logistics, just be able to document. Yep, I meet with my students. And in fact, here's a list of 14 students who I had one hour conferences with over the course of the quarter to ask them how they were doing. You know, same thing with Barry. Barry Grave, the great example. So long as you can just document, yep, here's what I did. I met with each student for half an hour and talked with them about where do they want to be five years from now. That works. Okay. All right. So I said we're going to get into some definitions. So they said you have to provide substantive interaction. Here is your definition. So you may provide direct instruction. So that's going to be the way where most of you, at least initially, provide substantive interaction is you're just teaching. So congratulations. When you sit down and show people how to use a spanner or tell people how to draw blood or explain what f-stops are, that absolutely is substantive interaction. You're teaching them, okay? Uh, assessing or providing feedback on a student's coursework. I highlighted that because they're obviously defining feedback as, and sorry I keep using the same word, but substantive feedback. So. Does good job, Johnny, count as substantive feedback? No, absolutely not. But, you know, if we sit down and go, hey, you know, your second paragraph is weak, here's how you could have made it better. Or, yeah, I know that project didn't go well, let me explain to you, you know, the problem you did on the second step and that kind of ruined everything else for the rest of your project. You should have done it this way, you know, as you're opening up the engine or something like that, you know? So you're providing substantive feedback to them Again, the point is they're not flailing, wondering what they're doing wrong. You know, if you give them a bad grade on an essay, you know, you give them a C minus, they need to understand at the end of the day, Johnny's student needs to go, I got a C, and whether they agree or disagree with the C, they understand why Emily gave them that C. Again, they may think Emily's a jerk. We all love you, Emily. They may disagree violently with that C minus grade, but they at least understand why they got it. They go, and again, Emily, that jerk of a teacher, you know, says that I didn't actually use enough personal examples in my essay. That's what they're looking for when they talk about substantive feedback. That student knows how they're doing in the course and why they're getting the grade they're getting and how they're progressing, okay? Providing, and sorry, I've got too many windows here blocking everything, providing information or responding to questions about the content of a course or competency. And again, notice they're not saying it must be an announcement, it must be an essay, it must be an email. So long as you can document that you're doing it. If you host a Zoom session and say, hey, everybody, a lot of you had problems with the project. I'm gonna host a Zoom session at two o'clock on Tuesday, walking through that, does that count? Absolutely. If you send an email out to everybody or to the three students who got bad grades, does that count? Absolutely. If you send that announcement out, hey, everybody, almost everybody missed problem seven. You know, if Emily's teaching her math class, here's how problem seven should have been worked through and she posted in the announcements. That absolutely counts, okay? So you're providing information and responding to questions about the content of a course or competency. Again, it does not in any way, shape or form, they're not saying it has to be using this modality, whatever works for you. Zoom lecture, conference, email, posting a document in Canvas, all of that stuff works, okay? Facilitating a group discussion regarding the content 
of a course or competency. And again, this is obvious, but we've got the facilitating right there in bold. So uh, they very, very explicitly say uh, student groups do not count as regular and substantive interaction. Okay, they're great and you should have them, but a group discussion means you're facilitating, meaning you're there, not that you're the only one talking, but you're there, you're making sure it's going on, you're giving feedback to people. So that would be facilitating a group discussion. Okay. And then the last one we're going to skip, and that is other instructional activities approved by the institutions or programs accrediting agency. That would be if NWCCU decided to say, here's something that we're going to count, and we're going to make this very explicit. Okay. Angela's asking, do the announcements also stay in place each quarter via Canvas? Uh, yes, they should. When you copy the content from quarter to quarter, because I know a lot of you might spend half an hour on an announcement, you know, you write it, you know, it's two paragraphs long because you really want to lay out exactly what it is. You've got links to stuff, all of that. Those should go quarter to quarter. All right, next step. Uh, they said you have to have scheduled and predictable interaction. Um, and by the way, all of this stuff that you're reading uh, has, is about two weeks old. So they actually just put these into place before. Um, I love telling the story. Uh, I've, I've worked with Highline and they kind of shared how things went. They're one of the ones who was audited and they shared it with all the other community colleges. Uh, they went to Highline they audited them and i wish i was kidding but mark lentini the e-learning you know he's the tim at highline uh although you know way better <laughs> but um mark was there they went to mark uh they're auditing him and mark goes can you guys just tell me what is regular and substantive interaction and i wish to god i was kidding but the guy from the department of ed turned to mark and said oh regular and substantive interaction that is interaction that is both regular and substantive. So that was his definition. So that's about as useless as it gets. So the Department of Ed has ke had kept it really squishy. All, almost all these words you're seeing today, almost all these definitions you're seeing are about two weeks old. And technically they're all gonna go into play in June of next year, but we're not even gonna mention that because honestly it makes no sense for us to aim for you know, not meeting these standards by January 1st and then meeting the standards in July. So we're just gonna aim for the July standards of regular and substantive interaction right now. So they gave us a definition of scheduled and predictable interaction. There's a lot of debate whether you had to meet one of these bullet points or both, a lot of discussion. A lot of people said, please make it only one bullet point. But as of right now, the Department of Education says you have to provide both of these, okay? So what, that, what those are is providing the opportunity for substantive interaction with a student on a, and here's our key phrase, predictable and regular basis. And a whole lot of words here, blah, 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 blah. But let's just focus on the predictable and regular. So what does that mean? It means stuff that's scheduled. So let me open it up to questions again. You guys have already answered this, but give me some examples of predictable and regular interaction that you guys offer. Team, yes. I have a discussion every week. Do they know what time it is? Um, yes, yeah, so it's spread out throughout the week. So their mm -hmm. first folks would be on Wednesday, and then Perfect. they would have to reply to other students um, before Sunday night. Great, so it's predictable and regular, right? It's every week. I know Wednesday I go on, and before Sunday rolls around, I have to reply. Is that correct? Yes. Fabulous. Okay, so that would be a great example of predictable and irregular. Uh, just to follow up, do you monitor those discussion boards? Um, yes, I do respond every day. So I Fabulous. open that and uh, I make uh, some notes there. Yeah, so you're hitting it out of the park. It's regular. They know that it's going to happen every week. It's predictable. They know it's posted Wednesday. Uh, you're also meeting the thing as far as being substantive interaction because you're posting to it and saying, you know, good answer, Johnny. Hey, Susie kind of missed this. What do you guys think about this? She raises a great point. So you're hitting every single mark on that. Great job. Uh, let's see, I've got a few more postings. Barry says, I keep a course in Canvas called Resources that each student enrolls in. 
This resource course has everything about the program and program wide announcement. So great, he's actually providing extra information to the students there. Okay. Uh, Diane has question marks under responding to students when grading their assignments. Uh, actually, that's going to be our next one. So yes, that is, uh, that is interaction, but that's going to be the next bullet we talk about. Uh, Rebecca says regularly scheduled office hours, frequent announcements, feedback on individual assignments. Yes, again, the key there is the regular scheduled office hours. So if we're talking about just this second bullet, it has to be that predictable and regular. So everybody knows that Rebecca is in her office Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from one to three. Okay, we could also schedule Zoom appointments. You know, we have Zoom office hours. I know some instructors like require people to check in uh, seven, you know, uh, I've got all my students and I'm gonna meet with everybody for 15 minutes every week and this is a mandated check-in. That's a way of having it. So, so long as it's predictable and regular, then that meets the standards. And yeah, Barry says, publish a schedule. Bing, that meets it. Everybody knows it's predictable and regular. Every Monday at 3.15, we have this lecture. Every Tuesday at seven in the morning, we have this discussion. Perfect, okay? And then that third bullet on the page, which is what a lot of you also talked about, you monitor the student's academic engagement and success and ensuring that an instructor is responsible for promptly and proactively engaging in substantive interaction with the student when needed on the basis of such monitoring or upon request of the student. Okay, again, a whole lot of words. We tried to bold the key parts, all right? It's promptly and proactively. So if somebody gets a bad grade or if somebody's struggling or if somebody says, I hate this bleep 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 class, it's stupid and this assignment is horrible, you know, your bat alarm goes off and you go, oh, I better step in and interact here. So Ingrid says, man, this student bombed the first assignment. I can see that, you know, and again, this is talk that all of you guys may not even have it, so it's second nature to you, but I can see that this is gonna be a problem over the quarter. They don't understand uh, baseline subjects they're gonna need for the next 10 weeks. So she shoots an email off and says, hey, I wanna talk to you about this assignment, maybe meet with you one-on-one, -on -one, or let's do a Zoom session, or let me give you some supplemental reading to explain what this principle is. But in one way or another, you know, the teacher bat alarm goes off in Ingrid's head and she says, I'm going to react to it. That's what it's talking about here. I'm gonna intervene in some way. I'm gonna communicate with them and say, you're having problems, let's talk about it. The flip side of that is if someone shoots the email to you and says, you know, hey, Brian, I'm dying on this project. I have no idea what you mean by, you know, I can't even think of a photography word, sorry. Uh, Aperture, there, I made, up a, I made up a photography word, so I sound intelligent, okay? So I have no idea what I'm doing here. So the student requests, again, we don't want Brian to be fishing for nine weeks. If that student has to wait five weeks to get an answer to what is Aperture, then that doesn't uh, work. If Brian within the next, whatever his schedule is, you know, if Brian says, I'll respond within 24 hours and weekend request by Monday, if Brian meets those standards and says, hey, here's what it is and here's why it's important, or here's a link to a great YouTube video explaining to it, then Brian's hitting it out of the park, okay? So again, hit the pause button. Any questions on scheduled and predictable, or does that make sense to everyone? All right, got a couple of thumbs up, couple of yeses. All right, so we've talked about the definitions. Here's what it is, here's what the Department of Education says when they come in with their you know, 417 guys and their men in black outfits, swarm our campus and say, give us documentation. We now know, we now know what they're gonna be looking for, okay? Uh, so how do you do it? So we've kind of got three clumps here for regular and substantive interaction. There actually is a checklist uh, that's available on the website and that I'll send out uh, with the recording later today like I did yesterday we'll send out our regular and substantive interaction checklist, but I've kind of broken it up into three clumps. The first thing, we already talked about this a little bit, is start well. You can provide regular and substantive interaction and answer questions and guide your students by designing your course well, okay? Number one, you've got a good uh, start here page. As we see, we lay out the basics of the course. We say, here's how to get assistance. Please email me. I'll respond within 24 hours. The best way to contact me is by phone or by email. Here is the phone number or the email for the online learning center. Here's where our library is located. So 
you're already providing regular and substantive reaction by doing that, okay? Uh, you lay out what the course structure is. Again, answering the question, we're gonna do this every Monday. It's a 10 week course, here's what we'll cover each week. Uh, but your basic policies, here's my attendance policy, here's my late assignment policy. So again, you're not, uh, your student isn't going, well, I have no idea why I got 30%. You can point right to them and go, see this right here? It says 10% per day. What are your methods of communication? What are the requirements? If there's any prerequisites, again, you don't want to get in and do it and suddenly realize, oh my God, this person never took Math 101. So a lot of this, when we talk about designing the course well, simply says, answer all these questions you know you're going to get, because all of you guys are awesome teachers. You know the questions you're going to get. Let's answer them on day one or even better, like a lot of you guys have done. I'm going to do it during week zero before the class even starts. I'm going to get that information. So if somebody wants to call up Diane and go, uh-oh, I don't know what these terms mean. Am I in trouble? Dan can talk to that person before the class even starts. Okay, so does that make sense? Amy, you've got a question. Uh, yeah, I, I have actually two questions. Uh, no, one. I only allow one, sorry. <laughs> okay, you said you have a checklist. Yes. Do you also have an example just to visually see what a module would look like with these checklists in it? Uh, what I would say is any of the courses that we offer for training, like for example, the Getting Started in Canvas, all will have lots of examples of this. Okay. They all have a Start Here page. They all have the answering questions. They have a Meet the Instructor, which we're gonna talk about in a second. So any of our training courses will provide lots of examples of this. Okay. Okay, second question, because I like uh, it, you get the second one. Okay, then can we also put a quiz in there for the syllabus or what's going on? Can we do that? Absolutely, no, syllabus quizzes are great. Okay, okay, that's yeah. it. Okay, Thanks, good questions. Okay, so we lay off the start here page, we answer again all these questions you know that they're gonna run into yet preemptively, proactively, answer those questions as they're logging to the class their first time. Uh, I cannot recommend enough a Meet the Instructor page, especially those of you uh, who have students who've never been online and who have never met you before. You know, I'm looking at Barry right now with this camera on, and I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I'm gonna have a vague recollection of 12 of you attending the course, and Barry's the one I'm gonna remember because I've been looking at his mug for 42 minutes now. <laughs> as he turns camera off. Shame on you, Barry. <laughs> so, I mean, they're really, we know this so much. Any of you have taken basic psychology, we understand that visual image, that picture adds a lot. So now that Amy is the instructor of the course, we know Amy, maybe we know a little bit about what her personal preferences are, like she loves pasta, you know, uh, we maybe saw a picture of her playing with her kids or something like that. You know, she puts a picture in there. You know, we know a little bit about her. She's now a living, breathing human being as opposed to, you know, a Mac at BatesTech.edu, which is all that you are before they see that. You know, the person who said, welcome to my course. So add a Meet the Instructor page. You put an introductory assignment allowing the students to introduce themselves. By the way, for those of you who imported Mod Zero, that's built right into it. A first thing which says, hey, who are you? Tell us a bit about yourselves and what uh, is your experience with online education? And we even made sure to put, by the way, don't freak out. If your answer is I've never taken an online class before, that's awesome. There's a bunch of people in the same boat with you. So we built that right into Mod Zero for you guys. Okay, so that's some ways to provide regular and substantive interaction before you even hit the publish button. Um, one quick announcement. We did the uh, first day, we did the training, and a ton of people asked for um, a, a template because they were kind of a little unsure on how to provide some of that. So we just kind of built one. It's not the world's greatest one. Uh, we may beef it up next time, but we do have a template and we're gonna send that out uh, by the end of the day, provide that to you guys that kind of hit some of this stuff about how to lay out your course. So be looking for that in your email. We're gonna send out a basic template laying out a class, okay? Barry says, are there instructions on how to get Mod Zero to work? What do you mean by that, Barry? Do you mean how to get it into your course? 
Uh, I went to the email that came out and I clicked on the link and I went to, I got to mod zero mm -hmm. and I tried to import it and it didn't seem to work for me. And I know it's because I'm doing something dumb. If you click on the import download I and did. then you should see your course in there. So did you see your course? Nope. Is your course published? Yes. If you're the instructor and it's published, it should be in there. I agree. It <laughs> should be. I always say should, not will be. <laughs> should be. Uh, why don't you give me a call or shoot me an email and let's take a look at that today. Kind of explain what it is and I'll go in and look at it because it should be there. And then you download and you get that whole module just right into your course. I think the only downside is it, if you have a whole bunch of modules, it will put it down at the bottom. So you're going to have to move it up and publish it. But that would be the only issue. That may be what I did. Yep. Oh, and Diane just said the same thing. It was at the very bottom of your module, so make sure you check there. Okay, so that was our first clump of regular and substance interaction. Clump two, how do I do this? Instructor presence, I may only spend 12 seconds of this because you guys have already hit this stuff out of the park and said it, but three other ways to do it. You provide personalized weekly announcements. So, hey everybody, it's week five, keep going, fight strong, does that count? No, okay, but you guys talked about it. Here's what we're gonna cover this week. Here's key terms you should know. Here's the readings, be aware of this. That meets it. Personalized substantive feedback. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of you do this. I think one of my favorite examples is Elizabeth Sherman, who may write more in comments than the students actually submitted an essay. If you've ever seen one of hers with all the annotations in there, that's fabulous. That's a great way to do it. You know, she's typing away. She has 47 comments on the student's first page. You know, you, you need to go back and look at your subject verb agreement. I don't understand what you're saying here. This is a great example, okay? So you're giving them that personal substantive feedback. Can it be written? Yes. Can you actually record it? Because don't forget Canvas has that multimedia feedback so you can record comments. Can you email them? You know, can you talk to them next time you see them? Absolutely, okay? And then again, instructor participates in and moderates discussions, so you're there. Emily gave the example, you know, I comment on everybody's posting, you know, sometimes it's just a great answer. That's fine. Sometimes it's, boy, this is a great example. Does everybody see what they did there? And there's a little more substance to it. But again, you're participating in and moderating those discussions. Okay, so again, you guys hit this out of the park. I don't think, but I'll pause. Any questions or comments on this one? Three, two, one. Nope, because you guys are awesome. Okay, on to the last one. Again, we've talked about this, but you can also provide it by your course design. So for example, the course offers multiple means of representation, engagement, and learning. That basically means you mix it up, okay? You're not just lecturing every single week. Maybe you're lecturing one week, the next week you're linking to YouTube videos to demonstrate the concept. You know, Maybe that's Monday you lecture, Wednesday you have them go to a website, and work on their own. Different ways of them, a big thing that yeah, any education course you take is gonna say is say, let the students talk about what they care about, what they're interested in. So if Brian's doing a photography assignment, sometimes he wants them to specifically, you know, take a picture of a tall building that meets this shape because he's trying to illustrate a principle. Great, then do that, that's awesome and fantastic. But sometimes Brian says, you know what? I don't really care. I just want them to shoot something in black and white they think is interesting. So Brian tells us to walk around their community and try and find five pictures that represent where you live. You know, the students obviously gonna have way more engagement than if Brian says, you must go photograph this building on 72nd Street. So sometimes you have to tell them what to do. I understand that, that's part of teaching. But the more you can let them share their life and their experience, the more they're gonna be engaged with that. Okay, speaking of Brian, Brian, Apparently I'm psychic, your hand went up, yes sir. I'm a little bit out of sequence here and I apologize. Um, when we have a work-based learning agreement and mm -hmm. student is not here, how do we document the uh, interaction? Uh, how do you normally interact with the student in a work-based learning? Uh, in the past what we do is we usually call them on the phone, um, now we'll probably use Zoom. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is an excellent question that I don't feel comfortable answering. So what I would say is talk to your dean, but my off the top of my head answer would be, I would just document exactly what you said. You know, do, do you have to submit any sort of documentation like I talked to the student for, you know, 15 minutes and things were going well? 
Yes, my only concern is that's only one touch and in our previous slide said we need two. You know, with the work-based learning, you know, I'm going to punt and get back to you. I really don't want to talk off the top of my head on this one. So it's hard to distract, but I have to go to something in a minute. I just want to touch base on it. Thank. You. No, that's that's great, and thank you, Brian. It's a question I've never been asked before, so that's why I'm going to pause and look at it and grab my pen and write work-based learning here and try and get back to you on that. Yay! So Tim gets to learn something too. It's a good week. Thank you, Brian. Okay. So we talked about our multiple means there. Uh, course provides an opportunity to build a learning community. So you would want people to have that interaction with other students. Some of you have talked about this already. Maybe you provide discussion boards as a way of the, giving the students an opportunity to share. Maybe you have them work in groups. Brian talked about that. Maybe you do peer review where, you know, uh, let's use Brian's class because that's kind of leaping to mind. Someone submits photographs and then somebody else maybe evaluates it and says, you know, here's what I liked and didn't like about it. That's getting the student engaged in that stuff, not just in the content and not just with the instructor, which is part of it, but also involved with their peers. You, again, like a lot of things, you have to do this because the Department of Education says you do in some way, shape or form, but it's also a really great learning practice. Again, so much so in this pandemic with everybody going stir crazy, everybody isolated, mental health images, you know, or mental health issues are starting to bubble up to the surface in a lot of cases. So giving the ability to form a community with the Digital Media 101 class, in addition to being what Brian should be doing as an instructor, it's also something that is really benefiting the students as well. Okay, and the last one, just a quick note, uh, students are required to submit an academic assignment in the first 10 days of the course. I assume, you know, that's two weeks. I assume all of you are doing that, but things like a syllabus quiz and an introduce yourself doesn't count. There does need to be just some sort of academic submission in the first 10 days of the course, and that's a financial aid requirement. Okay, any questions on that one? Any comments, any brilliant examples, although you guys have already given a batch? All right, moving on, because again, you guys have already given great examples of all of these. So our summary, I, I think maybe the best way to summarize it is, again, in a basic ed class, they're gonna talk about, or a basic instruction course, they're gonna talk about community of inquiry. It's something that um, we've got a wealth of information over the last 40, 50 years, that this is one of the best ways to facilitate student success in any kind of distance learning. So are you providing these three things? Are you providing student content interaction? You know, are they given the opportunity to have meaningful interaction with here's the content, whether it's a lecture, whether it's a textbook, whether it's submitting an essay to you, whether it's doing projects, but they're actually getting in and interacting, not just reading, but interacting and engaged with the material of the course. You know, for some of you, that's very, very hands-on. You don't have to worry about it. They have to build something. They take their hands and do that. For some of you who might teach math or English, you might have to work a little bit harder, but the students are having a chance to interact with the content. We have student-student interaction, so um, they are able to interact. We talked about it, form a community, talk to their peers, and the last one is, are they interacting with you? Again, in meaningful ways, not just you saying good job or not just you posting announcements saying welcome to week four, but all these fantastic examples you guys gave, you know. I'm doing office hours, I'm posting announcements, I'm giving them feedback on their essay, I'm doing an example of stuff that the students do poorly, showing them how it should be done, you know, all of that sort of stuff that you guys have done. It's all, it's all great and fantastic. Okay, so uh, we are at the end of our session. I think you guys did a great job of kind of talking about it and explaining it. It seems to me like you guys have a really good handle on it. And all we did today was kind of put all those formal definitions and examples in there. But any questions, guys? And we're back to crickets because everybody's ready to leave. <laughs> okay, so uh, at the end of the day, sometime before the end of the day today, we're gonna send this, uh, send this video out to everybody. But also along with that, be on the lookout because I'm going to attach this um, regular and substantive interaction of checklist there. So you'll have that available as well. All right. But other than that, everybody, thank you all so much. And I hope you guys have a great day and a great week. Um, by the way, I did send out the link for tomorrow's training. That's the one at 715. 
uh, on Panopto, how to record your classes, how to record your lectures, and make them available to your students. So be looking for that in your email. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Tim. Very welcome.